here we go. So we've got the mic there. I'll hold it by this one. For me? Oh, this one. That looks for laser pointer. Okay. Or you can, uh, you can go this way too if you want. Uh, no, I don't have such a thing. It's okay. fine. Use this one. Perfect. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I feel very lucky to be the last presenter this afternoon. And thank you very much to, uh, for your patience to be here um, at late afternoon, Friday, uh, beautiful full season with maple leaves start falling. Um, so my uh, presentation today will um, look at the uh, 3D uh, modeling for seismic uh, soil and structure interaction. Uh, and we look at some application, um, focus more on um, give some comparison on trend we move to 3D modeling from the 2D modeling. Um, and I introduce a bit about the 3D soil constitute model for uh, liquefaction modeling. And we look at the um, seismic induced structure performance and the soil liquefaction. Um, with 3D modeling, we will also be able to look at the effects of the earthquake direction. Um, and we will uh, do the exercise by do some 3D modeling of uh, soil reinforcement using the deep soil mixing uh, grid. And last, we can look at the way that we can model uh, 3D structures in our geotechnical program. So um, the um, 3D uh, geotechnical uh, program has been uh, available for uh, kind of many years, and practically it has been used widely in a lot of applications, uh, also for soil and structure interaction. Uh, but most of them are for static application. Um, for seismic uh, application, especially where we have the cofaction issue, um, uh, I see that we still rely more on the 2D numerical modeling. So in a lot of applications that we use, um, our geotechnical engineer, we support the design of structure. We do that in the uncoupled approach which means we do um, kind of complex, uh, complex um, flag or plastic modeling. We consider the soil uh and consider the residual strength of the soil. And then what we give to the structural engineer is much more, uh, much simpler than what we, we, we hope for. We give them a couple of springs in vertical and horizontal direction. And we give them displacement profile. And what the structural engineer they use, they will model maybe linear spring, maybe uh, sometimes you linear spring, and they try to input our displacement in their model, and they all run their old model. Uh, as a user engineer, we may ask what we give the structural engineer is really what will happen during earthquake. Now the displacement we give mostly will be the end of earthquake. But we know that during the earthquake, especially where the deformation of structure, if we look accumulation process, it's not just one second we have that displacement. The spin we give them, whether it's the beginning of earthquake, or the middle earthquake, or the end earthquake. The stiffness of soil change during the earthquake, so the value we give them may only represent one point of the earthquake. And for some scenario, we give them the spin and the use that to model the pi. We know the spring is for 2D, and somehow they use that to model the pi. And it may not um, the way that we always set, satisfy ourselves with. So now, um, 3D program is available. Um, traditionally, we focus more on the 2D modeling of the liquefaction assessment uh, because we don't have um, kind of practical soil models that can model effectively the soil liquefaction. So in Vancouver area, we, we start with the UBC SAND model, which is the uh, effectiveness, uh, effective soil model uh, back uh, from uh, Michael Beatty and Peter Byrne 2011. And then uh, we have the PM4 SAND back in 2017. Uh, SIMNA is kind of the dominant uh, soil model that we use for soil liquefaction. Uh, but UBC SEN and PM4 SEN are mostly, uh, if not, it's only for 2D plane strength simulation. They're not yet 
for 3D. Um, the framework DM04 from UC David, they add the general 3D framework. And from that, um, pm 4 uh, and Sandy Sen were developed. So they are both uh, 3D uh, framework and can model 3D problem. So um, in this presentation, I won't go in deep into make the comparison which one is better, uh, but I will select the P2P Sen model, uh, which is available in flat 3D program to analyze some of 3D aspect of the program. So detailed calibration on the P2P Sen model is provided by the author. Um, so uh, the, the way to calibrate is very typical. If you look at the P and for same model or UBC the same model, uh, here on the left is the calibration to the liquefaction triggering curve. Uh, typically, we do with Yao or Erich and Boulanger curve. On the right, we with the cyclic stress uh, ratio with the number of cycles to reach liquefaction. Basically, people will look at the slope of that, get the, um, the log scale, and get the factor A and B, and see if that's reasonable with the lab uh, testing program. And then they look at the element test. Uh, uh, they can do mostly the DFS like direct simple shear test and look at the uh, element result, look at the, uh, the way the effective stress has been reduced, look at the C strain, the volumetric strain, etc. cetera. Um, so I won't go into detail further into the calibration, uh, but the P2P SAN model, the way they develop, they try to make it more convenient to the user by trying to uh, set up the default calibration, so the user may not need to, to do further calibration unless it's necessary. If they have more data or they want to calibrate the data to a certain way. So, so, so start looking at the, the model, I would look at um, uh, three case studies. So the first case study is uh, quite simple, uh, that's the embankment dam on the liquefiable soil. This three model actually is just a 2D model that we extract that in the out of plane direction, we make it a 3D model. So it's kind of a you know, typical embankment uh, going along the river where we have a top, maybe a dense sand, and with a, um, a tray meter of the loose sand material, and below we have the sand gravel with medium um, relative density, and we have the base here. Um, so the water level is around at the elevation zero. So in this one, um, I apply uh, a lander's earthquake in the X direction, which means in our plane's strain direction, and to see uh, how the p 2 p sand model behave. So what I see is behave pretty well. Uh, we look at the pattern of a top uh, figure is the horizontal displacement. We see the, the, is the large displacement about 2.4 meters at the second bench leading to the river and the top uh, displacement of the embankment is about one meter. Uh, we can also observe the, the way that the pore water pressure uh, had developed. Uh, here I mark where the red area where the pore water pressure ratio reached more than 0.9, which indicates the soil is liquefied. Uh, we have slightly less uh, liquefaction here in this slope due to the static bias, uh, like the stress bias here, so we have less value. But but other than that, we have quite uh, you indicate the soil may liquefy. So in this example, because this was simply extracted from 2D to 3D, we have opportunity to see uh, first between the 2D and 3D version of the P2P SEN model, how it behaves, and then we compare with the 2D uh, PM4 SEN model. So what we see the deformance on the dam, if we look at the 2D and 3 model using the corresponding 2D and 3 PP, P2P SEN model, the displacement of the, of the dam, embankment dam, is quite similar. If we look at, compare with the 2D PM4 SEN model and compare with the P2P SEN model, the PM4 SEN model gives the same trend, the same pattern, uh, just slightly uh, higher uh, displacement. Uh, of course, this is, for this one, we use kind of default calibration to the Boulanger curve and kind of all typical correlation without any having any lab testing. Um, depending on the project, maybe the comparison may give different results, but for the exercise, the behavior between the two models is quite uh, similar. So we get more um, confidence on, on the way they behave. So I look at the more complex case study, and here is the anchor keyword system where we have 
uh, the, the, uh, the wall have to retain the soil uh, up to about 50 meter high from the grade of about 5 meter to the ridge elevation of the minus, point, uh, minus 9 meter. Again, we have the loose sand with the relative density about 35 percent. And below that, we have like better material with gravel and sand and some stiff seal and the base here for our modeling. So the, the flag 3D program uh, can model pretty well the structure. So here is the, uh, the, the structure we have. Here we have the keyword with the, the kin pies with the 14 to 22 millimeter outer diameter. We have the inferior seat pie with the AZ pie, and we have the anchor wall here. So the anchor wall is connected to the, to the keyword using the, the system of tie rods facing about um, 2.9 meters. So put it in here on, on, on the um, one on the uh, on the left side, just, uh, I make the layer soil transparent so that we see how the structure is in place within the soil here. So the way we do, we do the seismic, but we apply a shaking at the bottom, and then we will see how both the soil and the structure will behave together during the earthquake without having to do the uncouple analysis. So if we look at the soil behavior, we see the horizontal di displacement about one meters, and it's kind of the typical wedge action that we see. It develop near the top of the keyword and go to somewhere near the bottom, and then get a hinge uh, kick at the uh, at the toe and go to the upsaw area. Uh, we also observe the pattern of the liquefaction. Uh, RU is more than 0.9 meters, indicate we have some liquefaction here that caused the kind of relative large deformation of the keyword structures. Because we run on, uh, the couple of analysis, we will also be able to look into the performance of the structure. Here is the end of the earthquake. We can see the deformation of the keyword, the tie rod, and the anchor wall along with some other aspect of the uh, structures as we look, can look at the bending moment and things like that. Doing the 3D modeling will allow us to look at uh, the earthquake direction. Traditionally, we only model in 2D, so we model that in plan direction, and we always ask ourselves how we model the earthquake in other direction. We may stack assumption, maybe to 50% or 90%, or we also make some assumptions otherwise. So this one, for, for now, I have applied in X direction, mean in our plan direction. So let's apply the earthquake in the Y direction, mean the our plan direction. See uh, what do we have. So if we look at the wall horizontal displacement, um, here the earthquake is in X direction in the top left, and the bottom left is the earthquake in Y direction, mean our plan direction. So the displacement of top of the wall is about 1.1 meters, and you can see the, the Y displacement of the wall is, is zero because the earthquake is in applied in, in X direction. Um, but if we apply the earthquake in Y direction, and we can see the, the, the Y displacement of the top of the wall is essentially follow the bottom of the earthquake. But the reality displacement is negligible. However, the displacement of the wall even if the earthquake is implied in the y direction, it's still significant. It's not in this in this simulation. It's not much smaller than if we apply the earthquake in x direction. So to answer this question, I look at the pore water pressure. So here, if the earthquake applied in x direction, we see a significant development of pore water pressure uh, behind the keyword. If the earthquake applied in y direction, we still have less, but still have the considerable development of pore water pressure here. I, uh, we need to look in more into that, but my, uh, my judgment is even if the earthquake apply in the our plan direction, the soil is still subject to the same shaking, and the soil liquefaction can still happen. And with the soil being liquefied, it generates the force acting on the keyword, and the keyword still deflect. So, in our design, even if the word in applying all directions, not more than the, the most critical direction, you can uh, still not be able to say that the world displacement, if we apply the earthquake in other direction, would be negligible, if still had a considerable amount. Of course, this one is only for one example. We need to look at that further in order practical project in order to, to qualify the amount. Um, 
Here, uh, using a 3D model, we can have the benefit of modeling the, the 3D uh, deep soil mixing grid. Uh, the deep soil mixing grid main purpose is to generate kind of searing box that will retain the liquefiable soil in between the grid. So it will, it will, it won't allow the soil to liquefy because it's the shaking of the soil being limited. Um, this one is, is have a lot of limitation if we try to model in 2D. Uh, so it's kind of perfect example if we try to uh, model that in 3D. Here I model the sea boxes in the 10, 10 meter and 10 meter grid and move it both onshore and offshore area. Uh, I use a typical uh, US strength of about 1500 kPa, uh, even though um, in the same material, the, um, the UCS strength of the, the column can be even higher than that. So what we see here, the displacement is now being much reduced and so on, we don't see liquefaction within the DSM grid. So here, the cut section, what we cut is right in the middle of those grid. So the soil in here is being contained by those six boxes, so it shows very small development of pore water pressure, and so on, the displacement of the structure will be reduced as well. So here is a plot we say, uh, we show more about the reduction of the the world deformation with the soil reinforcement. So what's interesting here is that we reduce the DSM grid from 10 meter by 10 meter to 7 meter by 7 meters. The deformation re we would reduce more, but not much. So what what say is that even for 10 by 10 meter grid, the DSM grid worked pretty well. So it's, it um, it can it can be uh, the interesting thing we design. We can we can um, find a way to optimize the grid for, to reduce the cost for the construction. Uh, so similar 3 3D modeling can be an effective tool that we can help us to optimize our design as well. So the last case study, I won't focus much on, on the geotechnical aspect, but I would focus more on how we will model the structure, complex structure in 3D using our existing flat 3D program. So here, the structure we have like the, the marine pier, we have a lot of long pier, we have a lot of vertical pie and some butter pie near shore. And here we have the capping beam and the deck. So a typical structure. If we do the uncoupled analysis, we need to provide the soil displacement and spring parameter to the structural engineer. They will put the ITSA program or the ANSYS program. So you do the analysis. But if we want to do it in a couple analysis to, to see the, the behavior we can do so, uh, here, just like some uh, the plan strand of the uh, how our structure here, we have some uh, inclined uh, butter pie here, and we have like the R pie are about one meter diameter, and we have the capping beam is quite big with the pier, uh, with the deck is thick as well because they put a lot of crane, I think, on top. So we can see here for this example, we have a lot of uh, deformation going from the onshore to offshore area. Oh. Uh, in the near shore area, the displacement can be about two meters, but go, if you go outside that wedge, a slope wedge area, displacement go reduce about 0.2 to 0.4 meters. Because the, the, they had a connection of the pies from going from onshore to offshore, so the, the total displacement of the, uh, the pier structure will be somewhere between 0.2 to two meters. Because they will, they will keep, find the balance between those things. Um, so here, we, uh, from the program, we calculate the max deformation of the pier structure is only about 0 0.5 meters. So uh, maybe the, the figure is not clear, but from here we can see how the, the pie or the pie being deformed. Um, the top of the pie will deform the same amount because of the rigid, uh, rigidity of those with the capping beam and the deck connection, they will deform the same, but the bottom will be deformed uh, differently because of the soil dis uh, displacement. Um, here is Excel plot that we say uh, we see displacement at the model base uh, with time uh, and displacement at the uh, deck of the pier and we see its displacement is about 0.5 meter way less than the displacement of the soil that near the slope. So I have a quick conclusion. Um, so 3D soil models for liquefaction modeling um, have been available in commercial software. For now I can see that the sandy sand and the P2P sand model they are both built on the um, DM04 framework, which, uh, from which the 
PM4 sand model has been developed too. Uh, and I also overheard that the, the, the PM4 sand model 3D version is being developed as well. So hopefully in the near future, we get a 3D version. Uh, the 3D seismic modeling has shown some advantages over 3D modeling, uh, especially when we talk about complex geometry and uh, soil structure interaction, or we talk about soil reinforcement or soil improvement application. Um, the 3D modeling can be carried out at a detailed simulation after we do our 2D modeling on the full set of design earthquake records. We get like, for example, earthquake that have represent the uh, average on the maximum behavior and we choose this one to do a 3D modeling to optimize our design. And the last thing is the simulation time for 3D modeling uh, can be practical. It doesn't it take longer than 2D, but it doesn't take a month to run that. It take for three or four days and, and even faster if we put that in the cloud computing and, and utilize the power of the cloud computing on, on some uh, commercial platform and we can significantly reduce the simulation time. So I think um, three modeling for the fraction and seismic application is there and you can use that. It may, it may help us to optimize our project and maybe make benefit to, to our design project. So thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. Uh, I'm the last presenter, so hopefully you have some time. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I haven't any. Uh, that's a good exercise. So this this uh, early exercise, I just try to understand uh, the fundamental behavior that for sure is a very good idea if we implement more complex behavior and try to understand by like, horizontal in both directions, maybe the vertical component, how it contribute to the to the behavior. That's a good idea. Uh, and we do that in further space. Thank you. Um, how, how we can get comfortable with the results to see the model? Um, yeah, that's a good idea. We compare with some um, result of centrifuge testing. Um, however, um, uh, the most of centrifuge testing I see is either they do it in plain field or they do it in kind of plain strain scenario. So in plain strain scenario, it's the, the 3D program result is not much different from the 2D program because it's just like extrusion from 2D. And most centrifuge program, they just put a very simple geometry to understand. So it's not much uh, benefit of 3D, we model that in 2D. Of course, if they have, uh, there's some example, they, um, they put that in 3D, it's, it's what I, that's my next plan, um, just to do a lot of research and we, we, can, uh, we can understand more about that. Um, uh, my presentation message is, is try to, to introduce some of the soil models and how we can model that one. And, it will be the con contribution of the entire uh, industry or our community to make uh, the three modeling efforts be ready and be reliable to a level that we feel or feel comfortable that we can adopt them for our design. Yeah, uh, just to comment, I, I am familiar with centrifuge testing. I believe it's almost impossible to create a lamar lamar uh, box for centrifuge to move and see uh, two dimensions. Usually, uh, is but, uh, yeah, very nice thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, your contribution is uh, greatly appreciated. I have one more question. 
right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Victor. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, all right. So thank you all. If everyone could actually just join me in giving a final round of applause to all of our presenters today. There is So that concludes the 29th uh, annual Geotechn Vancouver Geotechnical Society Symposium. Uh, a couple of announcements to make. So as we move into the fall, we'll be starting up our next, um, our next season of programming. We sent out a call for nominations if anyone is interested in becoming part of the executive or member at large. Um, you should be able to find that in your inbox, but we'll attach that to the next meeting notice. We have a couple meetings coming up in early October as well as late October. Um, for those of you, hopefully everyone still has their name tag, on the back there should be a drink ticket. So, no, oh, I'm just going to turn So, for our social hour, uh, you can get yourself a drink. And one last thing, I think this whole event wouldn't be possible without all of you, but especially the two symposium co-chairs who put this whole thing on, they asked me to be to MC. I might be the face, but they were the men behind the curtains. So we have one of them here, which is my friend and colleague in this, Maddie Shravey. If we can give him a round of applause. And I don't see Jared Whitehead, but he's around. I've seen him quite. Oh, there's friend and colleague Jared Whitehead. There we go.